faculty in the School of Art and Design, studio faculty at least, that doesn't have a BFA. Um, I spent my undergraduate study uh, pursuing a degree in literature and a, a joint major in ethnomusicology. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my interest in Indonesia biographically in just a minute. Um, but I spent about six months uh, of my college years uh, studying music, art, and religion in Bali. Um, and when I think of like my larger kind of biography or life as an artist, I kind of think that's where it began. Um, I decided much earlier in life that I was going to pursue a life in the arts, probably sometime in high school. And it took me a long time to figure out what that was. I mean, even after I completed these degrees in literature and music. Um, but th there was something about Bali, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in just a few minutes, that like um, provided a new model for me, uh, personally, emotionally, philosophically, that was really pivotal, um, as well as like the self-discovery that happens in such a, an extreme culture shift. Uh, I think I'm going to do something that most studio artists or most faculty members from the School of Art and Design don't do with their Bergen Forum, and I'm not going to talk about my own work. Um, the past couple of years, uh, I've received some very nice awards from a couple of different uh, agencies to support my interest and in work in Indonesia. Uh, first was a fellowship by the Cornell Modern Indonesia Project, a research fellowship, which was a great honor. Um, Cornell is an, a, in, a it's a place where Indonesians go for Indonesian studies. It's a, an, a program that has a global impact on particular fields of linguistics, arts, and um, history of Indonesia. And just recently over the summer, I was awarded a grant by the American Institute for Indonesian Studies uh, to spend my sabbatical next semester in Indonesia. I'll be there for about four months. And I'm going to be pursuing uh, three different projects in Indonesia. Uh, first and foremost is a since I've begun my life and career as a photographer, I've been to Indonesia a number of times, but never for a substantial enough chunk of time that I could really explore my identity or my life as a photographer in Indonesia. So that's one of the primary goals. And I'll talk about some of the others a little bit later on. Um, whenever I talk about my own work or whenever I talk about Indonesia, I like to play a short recording, which is where it all began. But before I do that, uh, when I'm talking to people who might not have that much familiarity with Indonesia, um, it baffles me, I say this all the time to people, I mean, some of my friends will, will have heard this before, it baffles me in the post 9-11 era that Indonesia hasn't been at the forefront of our cultural consciousness in terms of like trying to create new relationships with the, with the Muslim world. Indonesia is the largest Muslim population in the world. It's about 18,000 islands, which you can see here which stretches between Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, and Australia. Um, and it's the third largest democracy of the world after the United States and India. And their first democ democratically elected president was a woman. So, uh, and beyond that, there's, it's, uh, it's an amazing place. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that have held my attention. But before I do that, I'm going to play you a short recording. It's about two or three minutes, and I might play the whole thing, and I might not. But just to give you a little flavor of where this all began for me. some kind of menial labor job at General Motors in, in Detroit. And he joined a photo club on weekends, like a lot of middle-aged, middle-class men were doing at that time in the 1950s. And his camera, camera 
Camera Club pulled together some money to bring Ansel Adams um, to come for a weekend to do like a workshop. And Ansel Adams started the workshop by showing um, the students in the workshop some of his photographs. And the story that photographers tell is that when Harry Callahan saw those, he said to himself, I don't know what that is, but whatever that is, that's what I am. And he turned around and quit his job at General Motors and he his life to photography. Reinvented the medium in the United States. And I tell that because I had a kind of a similar experience at an important time in my life. Um, I was a literature major and an ethnomusicology minor, and I had all but finished my major by the end of my junior year. Um, I just had to write a thesis, and the program that I was in allowed me two months for that. So I decided to spend most of my senior year abroad, and uh, I was planning on going to Africa to study music, uh, Eastern Africa. And and at that particular moment uh, of my life, I spent a disproportionate amount of my waking hours in these record stores. And I bought this record just because of the record label it was on. It was a recording of some classical music from Java. And I, I had that kind of epiphany, like not necessarily what, what was described in that story of Callahan's, but I knew that I had to know something about this. Uh, it just like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. What we're listening to in the, this recording is a composition written in Bali, which is a remarkably unique island that's smaller than Rhode Island. You can't really see it. It's um, it's smaller than Rhode Island, and it has a language and uh, religion entirely indigenous to the island. It's a form of tantric Hinduism. And because there, there's not much of a written history, nobody kn really knows how that happened. Uh, I can talk a little bit more if anybody's interested with questions about Hindu Buddhism and how that came to Indonesia. But so that this particular composition is for an orchestra of about 20 to 30 bronze percussion instruments doing interlocking uh, rhythmic and melodic patterns. Uh, and I had never heard anything like that and it, it struck such a deep resolve or chord within my imagination. So I. I, fortunately, the program that I was going to go to Africa with uh, had a, a sister program or something like that in Indonesia. So I'd already started filling out the paperwork, and it was, re it was really easy to switch. Um, and I've been going back ever since. Um, my primary interest in Bali in the beginning, I'm sorry, my primary interest in Indonesia in the beginning was Bali. And uh, over the years, it has kind of morphed into a much bigger interest in Java. Generally speaking, uh, most Westerners or tourists who go to Indonesia go to Bali and Java. And there, there are some good reasons for that and um, probably some bad reasons for that. Uh, one of the primary reasons is they're, they're those two islands um, are really the economic heartbeat of Indonesia. So they have a lot that can support tourism and they have really great museums and things like that. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the differences of some of the islands and what, what's held my interest in the two different places uh, just a little bit. But when I left college, like, I had already decided to make this commitment to a study of the arts, and I had kind of dis discovered photography by this point, but I hadn't really started making photographs. Like, it took, like, a couple of one-week uh, long workshops. And I thought Indonesia and studying Indonesian art was going to be um, my life's work, really, at that particular time. So I moved uh, to Denver and I joined this uh, nonprofit organization called Tunis Makar, uh, which was largely a group of musicians uh, working together trying to learn um, classical and contemporary classical, like traditional and contemporary classical music from Bali. Uh, but to support that hobby or addiction that the 15 or 20 of us shared, um, we also started like this, this program to advocate Indonesian arts in the United States. And we sponsored a residency program to bring different types of Balinese and Javanese artists to the United States. Um, we did a lot of outreach with uh, different public schools, elementary schools, uh, universities, all across the Four Corners region. Um, this is a, an image made at a Boulder Asian Arts Festival. Um, when I first joined the group, it was probably 75% American, 25% Indonesian. Um, when I left, uh, it was about 50-50. I played with this group and worked as part of the nonprofit agency for about four or five years and started my interest in photography while I was working here. On the eve of my departure to move to Boston uh, for my MFA program at Mass College of Art, 
uh, the orchestra, the musicians that were playing as a part of this nonprofit, were invited to play at this very prestigious music and arts festival in South Bali, uh, just outside the capital city of Denpasar, the Bali Arts Festival. Uh, it's kind of like the Whitney Biennial of um, Indonesia, so to speak. And we were the second uh, American, the third non-Indonesian orchestra to be invited to perform at this. Uh, but I decided not to go for a couple of different reasons. And uh, one of them at that time is, uh, I, I guess like as a, a student of literature or as kind of a, a sensitive cultural being, um, I had lots of questions about cultural representation. And somewhere along the way, this group of people that I was working with kind of crossed a line in terms of what I felt comfortable about representing a culture that wasn't my own or teaching other people about an art or a culture that wasn't indigenous, indigenous to my own upbringing. Uh, so I, I instead moved into a graduate program and kind of embraced um, the arts of my own culture. And I kind of turned off the Indonesia switch for about 10 or 15 years until I moved to Ithaca about 10 years ago and was able to start playing uh, the music again with a gamelan, a Javanese gamelan percussion orchestra at Cornell and have been able to connect with the Southeast Asia program and the Cornell Modern Indonesia Project. Um, I'd like to start talking um, about Bali, which is where it all began for me. Um, I, I think any student, and I, I think it's probably really uh, woefully connected, uh, I'm sorry, woefully neglected, um, in kind of global art history texts, uh, kind of fail to look at what's going on really outside of Western Europe and the United States, maybe a little bit of South America. But I, I personally think like the, the modernist kind of painting movement in particular that happened in Bali between the world wars um, is just a remarkable period of time in kind of the world's art culture. Uh, one thing that I, sh I should specify, like for the sake of this discussion, like I'm not really an art historian or really a, a researcher, you know, a studio artist and research is part of my practice. But I'm thinking of modernism really as the first half of the 20th century. Uh, when talking about the, the early history, the early modernist history of painting in Bali, um, people often talk about two European painters that, that spent a lot of time in Bali, uh, which I understand is kind of problematic, like that's part of the Western art history. Uh, but I have noticed in some of my more recent research that uh, even kind of locally written art histories in Indonesia acknowledge the influence of these two men. The first was this man uh, named Walter Spies, who uh, went to Indonesia to play piano at like this Dutch expatriate bar in central Java, which he hated. And as an artist, he thought of himself as a painter. He just did that to make money. And he really fell in love with Indonesia, or I'm sorry, he really fell in love with Bali. So after he spent a year or two in Jogjakarta in central Java, uh, he moved to Bali and got really captivated by the painting. And in his own work, he, mi he mixed some of kind of the, the mannerist um, paintings that were going on in Europe in the early 20th century. With some of the thematic ideas that were going on in Balinese painting. Uh, the big influence that he's accredited, uh, both by European and Indonesian art historians, is, is kind of twofold. Um, he brought money, right? So suddenly, like, people who spent most of their days farming and painting on the weekends or at night or whatnot found new patronage and economic opportunity in Walter Spies and his friends who were coming and buying their paintings. Uh, but Walter Spies also uh, organized what became a really influential kind of, like, artist collective. It's kind of like a a crit group or like a little workshop group where people would come to his house in South Central Bali, just outside the city of Ubud. I imagine if any of you have ever been to Bali, that's where you went. Um, and he taught people how to use oil paintings and they started talking about perspective and things like that that were never really a part of the traditional vocabulary of painting that was going on in Indonesia. It was really like the eight, I'm sorry, the 1950s before art education was formalized in Indonesia. Prior to that, it was just something you kind of did with your dad and your mom. And um, what, is capt like what kind of captivated me about Bali, uh, as it has a lot of people, including Walter Spies, is you'll find more artists per capita in Bali than you will anywhere else in the world. It's so deeply uh, connected um, with their religion. And much of modernist Balinese painting uh, depicts scenarios from some of the different, uh, different Hindu myths or epics, like the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, uh, or the Panji stories, which is a, a series of um, Hindu folk tales about a Javanese prince in central, central Java. 
Um, so Walter Spies was a German, though he was brought over by the Dutch government. The Dutch occupied Indonesia for about 100 years. Uh, the second painter that had a huge influence uh, kind of in the economics and the education of, of painting in Bali um, was this very eccentric uh, and remarkably wealthy Dutchman named Rudolf Bonnet. And uh, he did some very similar things as, as um, Walter Spies. He provided a lot of economic patronage. Uh, he helped disseminate uh, Indonesian artworks in Europe. Uh, and he was part of this discussion, this classroom that Walter Spies developed in South Bali. And uh, he also had a remarkable collection. Um, like one of the most important museums in Bali is the Museum, museum Puri Lukasan, uh, which means like temple of painting, essentially, uh, which is in Ubud which is about 2,000 paintings, and I think really all of them are from his personal collection. I think Walter Spies was a better painter. I don't really like Rudolf Bonnet's drawings or paintings much. Right, so um, the, the bulk of the, the economic and creative engine uh, that happened uh, in Bali, even today, if you look kind of right in the center of Gunung uh, uh, Batu, which is the second largest volcano in Bali, and kind of to the southeast of that, you'll see the city of Ubud. And really, probably within a 20-mile circumference of Ubud, you'll find a lot of uh, other villages, like Piliatan or Badulu or whatnot, uh, which became kind of like these, these villages where art kind of became the primary economic um, activity or the engine or support for the, those communities. And Ubud was kind of the gallery district. It's kind of what Chelsea is in New York City today. It was the place where all those painters and sculptors and whatnot um, could go and sell their paintings to the Dutch and other Europeans that were starting to come in in the early 20th century. And uh, the bulk of my time in, in, the, er, in Bali has really been spent in, in South Central Bali. Uh, I think one of the, the greatest artists that none of you have probably ever heard of is this guy named, the man right in the middle, Igustin Yoman Lempad. Um, the way Balinese name themselves is really interesting and really telling. There's actually a lot you can learn about this man from his name. The E, the I, pronounced E, means Mr. Uh, Gusti would define his rank in the Hindu caste system, the Kasatriya, which means kind of warrior or royalty. Uh, Balinese, their, their first name is their birth number. So Nyoman means he was the third born child in his family. And then Lempad would be his proper name. Uh, Lempad was a remarkable architect and painter. Uh, I guess within Indonesia, he's much more well known for his architecture. Uh, throughout Japan, the United States, Australia, and Europe, he's much more well known for his painting. Um, he lived to be 116 years old and prophesied his own death. Uh, he was considered like a Hindu mystic of the highest order. And uh, that's part of what captivated me about uh, Balinese art in the beginning, is it was so interconnected with religion and mysticism. Um, often really accomplished artists can do particular duties that priests can do. So like an artist like Lempod, like he, he could conduct your marriage or make holy water or something like that. Somebody who had the creative powers he had unquestionably must have religious powers as well. His paintings are remarkably minimal. He doesn't use much color. It's mostly ink uh, with a little bit of water, watercolor added to them. They have a tendency to be really quite small. I don't know my Hindu mythology well enough to tell you particular episodes he's illustrating. This would be from the Ramayana, uh, which is the story of the abduction of Vishnu. I'm sorry, the, uh, the abduction of Sita from Vishnu. And you can see Garuda on the left-hand side, which is the steed of Vishnu, and Vishnu trying to uh, re-embrace Sita. I think his work is, re is remarkably surreal. He had a very eccentric imagination. Uh, and one thing that you can't really see uh, in the, uh, these projections is like his, his use of line, like it's so dis decisive and effortless and his pictures just like float on the paper. This would be an illustration from one of the Panji stories, uh, a series of Hindu, as I mentioned, a series of Hindu, Hindu folk tales about uh, kind of a, a religious political leader in central Java. Uh, one thing to emphasize to you, I'm going to talk about three or four painters from Bali, and I'm going to do the same in Java. And I think that um, the painters I've chosen 
particularly when I get into the next couple of painters, uh, became widely copied. Uh, so if you were to visit Bali today, you would see thousands of paintings that look like Ida Bakus Made uh, Lang's paintings. Um, but when he made them, they were remarkably innovative. Um, uh, Ida Bagus, again, you can learn a little bit about him from his name, uh, but Ida Bagus uh, means he's a uh, Brahmin class, which would mean he com comes from a family of religious and academically trained people. Uh, he's well known for two different types of drawings he did. Um, the first one, like this, uh, would actually be considered um, kind of magical talismans. They would be uh, totemic drawings, uh, drawings that would be made that you would like put under your pillow to cure particular illnesses or that would be mounted in temples for particular types of um, uh, ceremonies. But again, like artists who had clear and inventive creative power were understood to have religious power. And those two things were never questioned and they went back and forth. So Irabagus Marepuleng um, made really two different series that he became known for. The first are these magic totems. This would be another one of those. This is again illustrating um, a Hindu myth about temptation. Balinese myth, actually. Uh, and then I, I guess the, what he did that has become much more imitated in painting since he, he finished his career were these paintings of everyday village life. So this is a, a painting um, of a ceremonial dance that's really common in Bali, the uh, Barang and Rangda. Rangda would be an incarnation of Kali, who's the Hindu goddess of destruction or chaos. And Barang is the positive counterpoint of that. So Kali has been interpreted in a variety of ways. Um, she's often interpreted as a, uh, a demon. And this would just be a painting of another kind of village ceremony. And this would be really indicative, this one more than the other, uh, of the style that he generated that was really imitated by generations of painters afterwards. Uh, Ida Bagus Mare Togog um, lived in a village um, probably about 20 minutes southeast of Ubud called Sukuwadi, uh, which is most well known for the puppetry. Uh, again, those of you who know anything about Bali are probably somewhat familiar with the shadow puppet traditions, which are it's a remarkably unique art form. Uh, part of his claim to fame is he became a big collaborator of uh, Clifford and Hildred Gertz, the two anthropologists who studied Indonesia, taught at Princeton University. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about a biography that she wrote of him. Uh, and he did some things very similar to Ida Bagus Mare Poleng. Um, he made uh, these series of these magical drawings about nightlife in his village, which are just India ink. And these were actually all, <coughs> you can really challenge uh, the authenticity, I guess, if you want to think of it that way, anthropologically, where I think there, there are cultural critics that would really challenge the authenticity of these paintings, these drawings. Um, Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, two famous anthropologists who did a lot of their field work in Indonesia, came to Sukawadi and found these painters that were gathered around Irabagus Mare Togog uh, and commissioned them to draw, the, to make these drawings about their village life. And they gave them all directly to, to Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson who would psychoanalyze them, and I think Margaret Mead eventually made this declaration that all Indonesians, all Balinese were kind of insane. Um, she thought the whole idea of going into trance and whatnot, which is discussed often, even in painting, let alone with music and dance. But I think these are really amazing drawings that uh, you can see that it's, it's really primitive in some respects. They're not dealing with perspective. I mean, even in some of these later drawings of uh, I mean, the idea that he's uh, introducing perspective the way he is was something that hadn't been seen that much in Balinese painting prior. And uh, it's redundant, I keep saying Ida um, But uh, Togog, uh, you can see, wasn't really deal dealing with perspective. He ended up having a huge influence um, over Hildred Gertz in particular because uh, uh, apparently he was the son of a religious leader in his community and was often, he spent most of his youth uh, helping his, his parents uh, conduct these religious rituals. So when he would talk to um, Hildred Gertz about his paintings and his drawings, he provided tremendous insight um, into kind of like ritual and daily life and 
the early modernist primitive villages of Bali, um, which was eventually chronicled in this biography that Hildred Gertz uh, wrote of him, uh, called Tales from a Charmed Life, which is basically just a series of interviews of him talking about what each one of these drawings illustrates. And Hildred Gertz, um, unlike Margaret, uh, Margaret Mead, is widely heralded by Indonesianists as a really great anthropologist. And some of it was the relationship she built with him. One other painter that I really love that emerged in this time who is, I don't think is broadly discussed. In fact, I think lots of art historians, like real art historians, uh, presenting a subject like this might have chosen somebody other than uh, Iguzti Mati de Plog. Uh, he didn't necessarily have that much influence, but I think he's remarkably uh, individualistic uh, in his approach. There's very little known about his life, but apparently today we might classify him as Asperger's or something like that. Apparently he could go days without conversation and just huddle in a corner um, of his family compound and make these drawings that are often compared to Hieronymus Bosch. Like he's dealing with the same Hindu mythology. You can see some mutation of Ganesh uh, in this image. Um, but with a much more kind of tortured and uh, bleak uh, perspective on it. So separated by a very small strait, the Java Strait, if you look right here, Um, is the island of Java, and in terms of kind of the, the creative and economic, and I think even intellectual growth of Indonesia, Bali and Java have just had, had really been driven much of the archipelago. Um, for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to talk about three different cities in Java. Um, Central Java, which would be right here. Um, it had an unprecedented influence over Indonesian culture for 1,700 years. It's been the center of kind of the visual arts and intellectual or academic culture for millennia, like thousands of years. Borobudur, as you can see, would be in central Java. Borobudur is the largest Hindu monument, or I'm sorry, um, Buddhist monument in the world. Uh, What's important, like how that happened, is based in the city of Yogyakarta and Solo, also called Surakarta, with the Javanese royal family, the Javanese Sultanate. Um, the, the seat of the Dutch occupation of Indonesia happened in Java, and through kind of a divide and conquer mentality, they created a feud within the royal court and divided the family between the two cities of Yogyakarta and Solo. And there's fabulous wealth. Like the first universities of Indonesia were paid for by the, the Jogjanese Sultanate. Uh, Jogjanese would be from the city of Jogjakarta, typically called Jogja. Um, and just so in the city of Surakarta or Solo. Uh, but what really happened in terms of th this idea of modernism uh, is that the two courts were there. There's a lot of political unrest developing in the early 20th century about uh, the Dutch occupation. But for the most part, like particularly the sultans and the royal family, they were given enough political auton autonomy from the Dutch occupation that they could really exert their influence other ways. And one of the primary ways these two courts um, did so was kind of this competition in art patronage. They're constantly trying to outdo one another. So they're repeatedly commissioning new musical compositions, dances, bringing painters in and giving them everything they could so that they could outdo their brethren 80 miles up the road in Solo. Um, and the two courts would be the Manguna Karang, which would be in Solo or Sur Sur Surakarta. Eventually the Solanese, um, the Manguna Karang, became much more well known for their influence on music. And the art academy that's in Solo today is considered the best place in Indonesia to study music. And the other half of the royal family, I'm, I always mispronounce the name, would be the Hamengku Buwono, um, which really became the seat of visual arts and dance uh, in central Java. And today, one of the primary visual art academies is in Yogyakarta. Uh, the other big city, uh, when we talk about modernist art in Java, is here in Western Java. 
Joe Jakarta eventually became like an important seat for um, the overthrow of the Dutch. So there's a very pronounced kind of nationalism or Javanese sense of Javanese identity there. And the Dutch occupation was eventually repudiated throughout the archipelago, but they had a, a more benevolent influence over some of the bigger Western cities, including Jakarta and Bandung. Um, and Bandung, uh, Joke Jakarta, Solo, and Bandung, the first art academies in Indonesia were developed. Those in Joke Jakarta and Solo were created by the Indonesian nation, particularly the Sultanate. And the art academy in Bandung, which was actually the first one, was founded by uh, the Dutch, and that had a, an essential um, influence over the development of painting and other modernist ideas in the arts in Java. Uh, essentially, um, in the period between the World Wars, um, I would say after World War I that the, the momentum, probably the 1920s, the momentum to overthrow the Dutch began. And it took about another 25 or 30 years for that to happen. It's kind of late 1940s, early 1950s before they really overthrew the Dutch in entirety. But it really started in the 20s, and with that, two really important, um, two or three really important movements started to happen, happening in the intellectual and political culture, and thus the creative culture um, of Java. Um, I guess, like, really reductively, for a quick talk, um, those particular um, movements or trends that developed are a school of painters that emerged mostly in Joke Jakarta and Solo, who wanted to entirely reject what it was that the Dutch were bringing in. They said, if we're going to be like real artists, if we're going to be real Indonesian artists, we need to forget everything the Dutch have done for this country, and we need to reinvent it ourselves, and we, and we as artists need to make the visual vocabulary to help support that for the rest of the culture. And then on the other side, happening in Bandung, these people that were educated by Western painters, they were like, oh yeah, you know, we're Javanese, but you know, European ideas are really great too, so I don't see what the problem is. So in Western Java, you started to see like these intellectual and creative patterns emerging that were much more indebted to European education. And then you also had something in between. You had people who could, who had no problem borrowing particular visual syntax developed from Dutch patronage or whatnot uh, across the archipelago, but still really wanted to embrace an Indonesian identity. So I guess it was either you're Indonesian or you're fine with Indonesia progressing and working with the West, or I guess that middle ground would be the group of people who were like, oh yeah, we're Indonesian, but that doesn't mean we can undo this history we had with the Dutch. An example of the first school of the fervent nationalists is this guy, uh, Sujo Jono. I don't even know what the S stands for. Nobody ever uses it, they just call him Sujo Jono. When he was 24, he wrote this really amazing manifesto about going out and painting the real Indonesia. And he said, you know, like, all the people who, who lived under Dutch patronage were just, like, wallowing around in these, like, fluffy pictorial scenes of rice patties and whatnot. And he's like, go, f go paint the people, right? This is a nationalist revolution that's happening. Let's see what the people look like and, and develop pride in that. He thought that was really the goal of art. This is a self-portrait he did. He did a lot of these as well. It's one of his more um, famous paintings of a Javanese concubine to a, a Dutch regent. And uh, he certainly bought into particular mythologies evident in this particular image. Um, forget the name of the people. Here. It, didn't, it has something to do with like, the dawn of nationalism. And uh, he got involved in the guerrilla movement, like the, the real violence that started to happen between the, the Javanese and Sumatrans mostly um, around the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, had a huge impact on everything, as you can imagine, with the, the expelling of the Dutch occupation. But Sujo Jono, as the nationalist he was, also tried to make paintings to commemorate this moment, a real Indonesian identity. So it says, I can't remember the exact title again, but it's a painting of an Indonesian guerrilla fighter. A painting of a village scene in Java. Uh, Hendry uh, Gunawan would be an example of somebody who kind of fell in the middle who really wanted to paint Javanese culture, 
but wasn't necessarily interested in discarding this history they had with the Dutch. Like, he wanted to get past it. He was part of the, the nationalist movement, part of like the intelligentsia that allowed for the revolution. But he understood that you couldn't just ignore what happened. And in making a new Indonesian identity, he wanted to borrow particular things from the West, which I think you can see in like the color palette and some other types of gestures he's using in his paintings. Both these painters lived in Jogjakarta. Uh, kind of an anomaly and an exception to the, the three kind of paradigms I just set up, who's probably the most well-known painter internationally to come from this time is this man named Afandi, who also lived in Jogjakarta, who's often called like the Van Gogh of Indonesia, who is apparently wildly eccentric, and a lot of his peers um, discarded him as a complete lunatic. Uh, but he would make these just like kind of abstract expressionist figurative paintings, and he would just go into the markets of Jogjakarta and just paint these enormous canvases with just incredible physical energy in just an hour or two. But I, I think what's a little bit different about his work is he's like one of the few people from the time who's really self-absorbed and not thinking about kind of the cultural conflict uh, and how to best document that in pictorial styles. And to the best of my knowledge, he's the only one of these painters I'm showing who's ever exhibited, except probably Lempad in the, in the United States. And then the last one I'm going to show you would be an example of the Bandung school. This is uh, Sri Hari Sardad Sono. And uh, the Western influence is obvious. I mean, clearly the particular motifs, this would be like women carrying baskets from the market, right, balanced on their head. But clearly you can see the visual motifs are much more indebted to European modernism. go through these a little bit more quickly because there are two other things I'd like to talk about before I run out of time. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that um, to support m my research and my sabbatical I've been given these nice awards from, from Cornell and from the American Institute for Indonesian Studies. And um, basically like what I've demonstrated or tried to illustrate um, with the music and these paintings are a little bit about some of the things that captured my attention with Indonesia in the beginning. And um, for years, I mean, really off and on since 1992, maybe a little bit later than that, probably more late 96, um, I've been pursuing this dual life in the arts. That I've been a photographer and I've been playing Javanese and Balinese traditional and contemporary classical music. And I've often been asked, oh, you know, that's interesting. What do they have to do with each other? And this really kind of internalized emotional or philosophical way, it's really easy for me to see the connection of them. But generally, when people would ask me that question, I'd be like, oh, you know, it's two different things I do. But a couple of years ago, um, I had this idea. It's like, wait, like, why are they two different things? And I got some money through this fellowship to go to, to Indonesia, and I got a little bit of money from the School of Art and Design, uh, thanks to Leslie Bellevance and Bill Hall, uh, to spend about two months in Java uh, initiating the study on the history of photography in Indonesia. Um, which has been remarkably interesting, and this has a little bit more to do with what I'm trying to do in my sabbatical next semester. Um, the Dutch are huge advocates of photography. So photography has been in Indonesia since it was invented, right? They're daguerreotypists in Indonesia two or three months after the patent was released in the Netherlands. Um, but it wasn't really until the 1990s like the last 15 to 25 years that Indonesians have started making photographs themselves, at least within art, in the context of art. Like, obviously there was journalism and, and whatnot going on. But uh, until a more kind of contemporary history, photography was always seen as a, t a tool of the colonizer. And the Indonesians, like when they finally became a nation, have gone through various waves or intensities as to how much they reject the West. I mean, for a long time, it's illegal to show American movies in Indonesia. Uh, and it took them a long time to embrace photography um, uh, as a result of which. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some things that are going on in contemporary photography. But before I do so, I want to talk a little bit about photography that happened during the modern era. 
And one thing that was actually relative, uh, relatively new news to me is that the, the really, really influential French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson uh, was married to a Javanese woman and actually did a lot of work in Indonesia. Uh, he did this really rare and expensive book about um, temple dances in Bali. But he was also on the front lines of um, photographing the nationalist revolution. He went back with his wife to photograph the overthrow of the Dutch government. And what you see here is the Dutch presidential palace being looted by Indonesians after they threw the government out. Um, to contradict what I just said, the first known native Javanese photographer was this man named Kassian Chepas. And little is known about him. Uh, some people thought he was uh, Indo, which means he'd be half European, half Javanese, meaning had a European father and a Javanese mother. Uh, the more recent scholarship seems to think that he was a pure-blooded Javanese. Um, and nobody really knows how he learned photography, but he got really interested in photography, like probably around 1910, and became like the court photographer for the Jogjanese Sultanate, and made some of the first like really insider photographs of Java. He's in most of his pictures, uh, which has baffled a lot of like photo historians in terms of his intentions. Um, so this would be a photograph that he made of himself in Bora Bador, the Buddhist monument outside of Jogjakarta. This would be a cave of some, like probably fishermen employed by a Dutch agency off the coast of Jogjakarta. And again, you can see Chepas there in the foreground of the picture. These would all be albumen prints for those of you interested in that kind of thing. Uh, but his, the way he earned a living, the way he supported his interest in photography, was by photographing the everyday activities in the Jogjanese Sultanate. And you still go to the royal palaces in Java today and you see this going on all day long. Theater, I mean, now it's mostly a way of making money off tourists. Um, but it's also a way to preserve some traditional Indonesian creative culture. So the, as I said earlier, the Jogjanese Sultanate was funding a lot of choreographers and things like that and making these dances and these theaters um, based on the Hindu epics. And these next two pictures are some photographs that Kassian Chepas would have made to, uh, to give to the Sultan of Georgia. Uh, the other photographers I'm going to show you, just two or three more, um, and then I have one more thing to show you, and I think we should do pretty well with time. A man named Isidore van Kinsbergen, uh, who was a Dutch photographer. He's brought over to Batavia, which we today call Jakarta. The city of Jakarta is a contraction between the words Jaya Karta, which in Indonesian would mean Victory City. So when they overthrew Batavia, they called it Victory City. But he's brought over as a set designer for a Batavian, like a, um, a Dutch community's theater. And apparently, he, like, like Walter Spies, he ended up befriending a lot more of the, the Indonesians uh, and made these really kind of like quintessential late 19th century, early 20th century um, studio portraits. Again, a lot of royalty and affluent members of the uh, Javanese aristocracy. These would be the daughters of the Jogjanese Sultanate. I love this photograph. I think that's the Sultan of Georgia himself, or at least his son. Um, one other photographer I want to talk about is uh, Henricus Maranus Neve, which I'm probably mispronouncing. He's a Dutchman, who's actually part of the, um, the military, the Dutch military. And um, something that, m that those of you who keep up with current events, I don't know how current this is, but then like six or seven years ago, um, like we had the major tsunami in Southeast Asia. Uh, the part of Indonesia that was hit hardest was Aceh, which is a province in northern Sumatra, which is probably the most radical Islamic community in Indonesia and the most fervently anti-American and the most ruthless military the Indonesians ever put together. And the Dutch tried to, to, to bring the Achenese to surrender through a really bloody, bloody uh, siege on the region. They were never successful. Um, and this particular man, a member of the military, I think eventually was disbanded because he thought it was atrocious what the, the Dutch did in North Sumatra. And he wanted to make pictures of the Sumatrans that he came to admire and what they gave up to defeat the Dutch. So they, like, it's not that different from what happened in Iraq when you think of these guys in flip-flops and dishdashes fighting these guys in Kevlar body armor. 
you had a bunch of guys with swords and spears fighting people with the latest technology of 1940, uh, and they came out the victors. But they paid a price, and that's what uh, Neve wanted to photograph. One more photographer is a, a Dutch woman who spent her whole life in Indonesia, Tilly Weisenborn. It was kind of um, the closest thing to pictorialism. I mean, generally speaking, modernist photography as we know it in the West never happened in Indonesia. And uh, Tilly Weisenborn was kind of the closest thing to a pictorialist in Indonesia. And she made these really romantic pictures. Uh, but she, again, she's often considered an insider because she spent most of her, her childhood living among the natives. I mean, it sounds like a contradiction to call her an insider and then qualified again that she's living among the natives. But uh, I mean, she was fluent in Indonesian and Balinese and uh, thought of herself uh, as more akin to them than her Dutch upbringing. And I'm just going to glance over this, looking at the clock out about a minute or two. Uh, there are three things I'm trying to accomplish on my sabbatical next semester. The first is the opportunity to more overtly uh, mix my interest in Indonesian and Indonesian art with my own studio practice as a photographer. Uh, with, in collaboration with the guy you see hanging the photographs in this gallery, his name is Wimo Ambalabayong, really smart and funny and handsome, and he's a, he's a really wonderful guy, really charming. Um, I'm trying to organize what I think, will, what I feel quite confident in saying will be the first exhibition of contemporary photography from Indonesia in the United States. There have been similar exhibitions in Shanghai, Japan, Germany, and the Netherlands. But uh, Wimo and I, he's a, and became friends with him the last time I was in Jakarta. Wimo, in a way, I mean, photography has emerged in the art markets in Indonesia for the first time in the last 15 to 20 years. And Wimo is one of the first generation of Javanese art photographers. Uh, so the two of us are going to try and find some photographers to show here in New York, which I hope will initiate an Alfred. But I already have some other institutions interested in um, staging this exhibition. But it, it's been really interesting in my most recent travels in uh, Indonesia to meet what are really the, the first examples of like art photography made by Indonesians who have none of the preconceptions that we have here of what art photography is, which I think is a blessing and a curse. Like there's this remarkable sense of freedom and playfulness and performance they bring to their work. Um, but you have to sift through a lot of that to find like the real photographers, and which is another interesting dilemma. Like with new media and whatnot, you see lots of artists who make some photographs, uh, but very few photographers. And uh, these two people that I have here, Anki Prabandono teaches photography at the Art Academy in Jakarta today, um, and Mimo are two of the people I'm working with and trying to organize this. The third thing, I don't know if I have any time for questions, I'll take those. Uh, the third thing is I'm trying to create a collaborative educational experience with an art academy in Java to bring some of our students from the art school in Alfred to the art college in Java for like a three or four week summer workshop. Uh, and as part of that, part of my sabbatical, I'm going to be teaching some lectures, I'm going to be giving some lectures and doing some workshops at the art academies in Jokjakarta and Bandung as well. Probably out of time, but if there are any questions, I can try and take them. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Bill. Any questions? Yeah, Mario.